Hey everyone, welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I am your host, Blake Morgan. How are you doing today? No, like really, like don't lie. Like, how are you doing? You doing good? You're not doing good, that's okay too. When I'm not doing good, I listen to podcasts. I love listening to podcasts. Lately, I'm listening to The Armchair Expert, but I'm also listening to a TV show podcast about a show I love called Better Things on FX. This has nothing to do with our podcast today, but it's just relaxing in the morning when I'm running around the kitchen preparing for my kids. My two-year-old, he's drinking his oat milk. Today we have a really cool show because we have a really cool brand on the show. And that's what you guys tune in for is the good info from the great brands. Today we have Jessica Klodnicki on the show. She is the chief marketing officer of Skull Candy. I love the name of that company, Skull Candy. Um, today we're talking about her customer focused marketing approach. Skull Candy, if you haven't heard of it, is a lifestyle brand. It's known for delivering off the chart sound and high quality headphones, earbuds, and speakers. It's a youth driven company. Um, they focus on 18 to 24 year olds. They focus on extreme sports athletes like snowboarders. Fun fact, I love to snowboard, but I haven't done it in quite a while. Um, today we're talking about Jessica's work overseeing the full spectrum of marketing, creative, consumer insights, brand partnerships, product marketing. We talk about her approach to data, about what the modern CMO needs to do now to keep their finger to the pulse of the modern customer. Let's get to the show. I know you'll enjoy this interview. Jessica, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Where are you calling in from today? I'm in Park City, Utah. Oh, amazing. And is it a beautiful spring day in Park City today? You know, it finally is. It snowed up until last week. So oh my we're gosh. really happy to have some spring weather this weekend. Oh my gosh. Okay. So for our audience that don't know you, I want to get into your story and just how you came into this amazing role of CMO at Skull Candy. Yeah. So I I break up my career into two chapters. The first half, I worked on more traditional consumer products and everything from hair products to fancy pens, I like to say. But the second half, um, second chapter, I was very passionate about sports and outdoors and um, moved over into the sporting goods space where I went to work for Mizuno, which is a Japanese sporting goods brand that spans golf, running, baseball, softball, volleyball, and then went to Bell Helmets, which I'm going to pause. Did I read you went to school in Santa Cruz? Yes. I'm a banana okay. slug. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're wearing yellow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So moved to Santa Cruz, California, which I loved oh. and ran um, Bell bicycle and motorcycle helmets along with couple of other cycling industry brands, but really the, the brand was rooted in action sports, which I, which I loved. Um, went to, as part of the same company, work on Camelback, if you're familiar with the backpacks, hiking, oh, yeah. skiing, et cetera. And then Skull Candy recruited me um, here to Park City, Utah to run marketing. And the, the brand was at a, a great inflection point. Um, it had gone public back in 2011 and then went private in 2016. So I came in right after the company went private where we were at, a, at an inflection point where it was time to sort of reset the brand for the next chapter. So Skull Candy is such a great name. For our audience and viewers that aren't familiar, can you tell us what it is? Yeah. I, so the founder, um, Rick Alden, he was kind of a semi-professional snowboarder was literally on a chairlift going snowboarding. And this was back, gosh, it was a long time ago. It was before all the wonderful technology that we have today. And he was listening to um, music on his MP3 player, but got a call on his flip phone and had to pull his gloves off, switch in between. And so the first product he invented was called the Switch. And it literally allowed you to plug into both devices and switch between music and calls really easily. But when he went to go source the product, that whole category back then, this was early um, 2000s, it was all black and gray and silver and not very exciting product. So he decided at that moment to bring his action sports background together with this, this patent. 
um, and create a very colorful, both literally and figuratively, a colorful brand that was very different than was what, what was on the market at the time. And so basically it was like candy for your head, candy for your skull. And um, ever since then, we've always had that action sports DNA. So if you came and walked through our building today, you wouldn't be able to tell if we were a snowboard brand um, or a consumer electronics brand. And, and we pride ourselves on that, on that uh, heritage. I remember when I discovered snowboarding, Jessica, it was amazing, but the music <laughs> was like such an important piece. And this was yeah. back in probably 2007, 2008. I don't remember the headphones I had, but it must have been a little challenging to keep the headphones in while not like killing myself on the mountain. <laughs> but I mean, the music is a big part of that adrenaline rush yeah. when you're going down that hill at a high speed. Like the music just makes your day so much more experiential. Yeah. I mean, that's true. So true for me, by the way, I'm a skier. I, I tried snowboarding for 17 minutes a couple seasons ago. It did, it did not go well. Not 18 um, minutes, 17. So it must've been pretty painful. It was 17 minutes of falling on my wrists and my tailbone. Um, oh, yeah. but, um, but totally I'm a, I'm a mountain biker, um, predominantly. And for all of our consumers and our, we, we call our audience the youthful and adventurous audio consumer. Um, and that is because they're adventurous both in their taste in music, but, but literally adventurous. And, um, we really believe music can power those types of adventures. Um, and not just across action sports, but we've really, you know, we love skate culture, street culture, art, and, um, in fact, our most recent campaign is called Find Your Frequency, uh, which we just launched in April. And that is truly to help people find their frequency, find you know the right soundtrack to whatever it is that they're passionate about. And music has been so important as well as outdoor sports during COVID when you know people are really suffering. They can't um, congregate with other people indoors. One of the only things they can do is be outside. Um, yeah. And then music, of course, is one of the go-to experiences when we're feeling down or we need to pick me up. Um, what did you see with your business during COVID as a marketer? Did anything change? Yeah. Um, well, a couple things. One, I mean, people did need our product during that period. So we were very fortunate to be one of the categories that benefited. So as people were working from home and schooling from home, sharing their home with siblings and parents and spouses, um, they needed, you know, a little bit of privacy. And so that the category really did thrive. Um, the other side of that, though, um, right before COVID, we didn't, we had no idea COVID was coming. Um, but you, you touched on a, a little bit, I think, of, of people's mental health, which um, leading into 2020, we always every year when we're looking at what we're going to do for the year, whether that's products or marketing communications, we look at what's going on in the world and what the macro trends are, good, bad, neutral, um, always really try to intimately understand what our consumers are going through. And so one of the alarming trends we saw, unfortunately, was uh, alarming levels of uh, mental health issues, especially for young adults. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that was being tied to social media as well. And, you know, we as brands play a big role on social media. And so Back in 2020, we launched a campaign called Mood Boost, um, and this was before we knew COVID was coming, and the whole genesis of it was that we wanted to bring only positivity to our social media feed. So every single month, we launched a very uplifting, beautiful theme, um, where we partnered with um, graphic artists, and we created this really inspirational, beautiful content, limited edition artwork, and vowed that our social media feed for a year was going to be nothing but positive messages. Mm -hmm. But also with that, um, we partnered with To Write Love on Our Arms, which is a, a mental health organization, um, really neat organization that um, targets particularly um, young people. Um, but they have a really interesting flavor because, you know, if you're out there seeking help, a lot of what you'll find is often a little cl clinical or intimidating. And as a young person trying to find help, there, there's not a lot of great resources. And so they have positioned themselves um, around music and action sports and all the things that we love. And we thought they were just an amazing resource that if you were a young person struggling and you came upon to write love, it had way more resonance um, than anything else we'd seen. So in April, 2020, crazy timing, we launched Mood Boost. Oh, wow. And, and we launched these initiatives to support mental health. 
And it was just, um, we were glad we could be a resource dur during that time because I think that one of the negative trends that happened was those um, mental health challenges got worse during that time. And we were prepared to point people towards some great resources and at least provide some hope and some uplifting messages at a time that was really, really tough. Jessica, as a CMO, I'm sure you track what other CMOs are doing, what kinds of communication strategies they're leading, how they're changing the way they paint the picture of the product. Um, what kinds of trends are you seeing or paying attention to as a CMO, um, just with the shifting tides of everything that's been happening in the last few yeah. years? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I mean, I, I constantly, I mean, A, we're in a fast moving space from a category standpoint in, in regards to the technology. B, marketing moves so fast nowadays that if you're not constantly scanning and watching what's going on, um, you can quickly get out of date. But And then we as a company, we, we look at um, just generally as inspiration, instead of looking at our direct competitors and the consumer electronics space, we genuinely go back to that action sports DNA. We look at um, what streetwear brands are doing and sneaker brands are doing. Um, and so that helps us do things a little bit differently, a lot differently than what our direct competitors would do. And so, um, so, that, so that's one. Um, but in terms of what's happening with marketing lately, obviously one of the biggest challenges I think CMOs and marketers are feeling right now is the post iOS privacy changes. And so, um, you know, many small to mid-sized brands like us were, were highly dependent on, uh, on paid advertising on social media platforms. And so we've really had to start to think about diversification, controlling the relationship more closely with our consumer and, um, and really adapting, you know, where we're playing in terms of channels. Um, and then, um, one of the areas we're having the most fun with right now is, uh, experimenting on TikTok. So we have a really young consumer audience. And, and what that means is while we have really strong awareness, every year we have you know basically a new cohort of young consumers coming into our space that we have to constantly um, communicate to, make them aware of us and stay relevant with um, you know with the trends and activities and music that that they're on top of. So you know we watch what's happening in action sports, streetwear, we watch what's happening in terms of marketing trends, and then we have to stay really on top of what's happening with these young consumers, which evolves every year, if not every couple of months. It is evolving so fast. So have you just changed your strategy altogether to become more customer centric and really listen to what's happening with customers like every single day rather than maybe annually or, or in the past before social and all of this um, just more rapidly, like listening to the customer all the time? Yeah, I mean, we we already were a very consumer-centric organization to begin with. Um, and what's interestingly, I, I, I'm not sure I should say this out loud, but I think the way advertising was working for a while, it allowed marketers to get a little bit lazy in that you would talk to the platforms and they would say, don't worry about your segmentation, let the algorithm do the work. And so... In doing that, you sort of released control over to a platform and you didn't need to know your consumer as well for those channels. Um, but we've always, always um, tried to stay intimate with who our consumer is. Um, everything from you know primary consumer insights and research that we conduct to um, you know really scanning and listening to what's happening on social media. We have a community manager that reports back to us. And um, more recently, we actually call, um, we've started to refer to a phrase we call digital health. And digital health refers to everything from customer reviews of our product to um, the temperature and the commentary and the conversations that are happening on social media to all of our you know, typical uh, digital marketing metrics. And what we did as a company that was really neat is we brought all these groups together. So this was customer service, social, the R&D team, the sales team, marketing team, we come together once a month in what we call our digital health meeting. And we report out across all of these metrics and we start to see patterns. So we can see if something's trending or there's a conversation happening on a particular product or a particular theme. Sometimes it might pop up for customer service first. Sometimes it might pop up on social first. And then we're all able to real time adjust, react, 
If something cool is happening, we can fan the flames. If we detect, you know, questions consumers have on how to operate a product, we're able to hit it and address it really, really quickly. So this digital health meeting has been one of the most brilliant things we've set up um, that is a monthly cadence that keeps the whole, or not just the marketing organization, but the whole organization in touch with what's going on. Do you talk about being a customer centric marketing department to your to your employees, to your team? Is it um, part of your DNA, part of your strategy? Yeah, I mean, we're we are very customer first, consumer first. We I I heard I wish I could give credit where credit was due. I heard somebody on a podcast recently that talked about themselves as the chief reminder officer. Oh, and so I, I feel <laughs> I feel like that's me sometimes because, um, you know, there's a couple things. In addition to the consumer, we have what we call our brand foundation, which is North Star, mission, vision, values, and our consumer. And almost every time we have any kind of important meeting or discussion, we talk about that first. And it's to the degree that I think if you tapped anybody on the shoulder here, they'd be able to tell you who our primary consumer target is and what those key pillars are for the brand. And we pound on it every time. And we press on it when we, um, you know, from a product perspective, when we're reviewing new products that are coming through the pipeline, we always go back to, at the before we even start to discuss the design, before we even start to discuss how we're gonna market the product, we always, always, always start with who that youthful and adventurous audio consumer is and point back to, are we or are we not serving this person? Are we achieving the mission we set out? Does this live up to the design pillars? We have this gorgeous brand book. Um, I call it the Bible that everybody um, kind of lives and breathes by as a, a filter for how we make decisions. And the consumer is a big piece of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you're very much, you very much have your finger to the pulse of what's happening with your consumers. Obviously, a big piece of that is customer data. How big is customer data with your everyday CMO marketing approach? Yeah. I mean, we very much balance the qualitative and the quantitative. Um, the I'd say our, our sophistication on the data front is evolving. Like, for example, we're right now um, interviewing um, to identify a CDP platform so that we can get um, better, closer, first-party data with our consumer. But we're steeped in data weekly, monthly cadence um, where we look at um, how everything is performing on the organic social side of things, paid digital side of things. Um, we really train an organization, honestly, that I'd say four and a half years ago, it was a lot of gut feel and instinct, and it was a wonderful thing. We had a passionate group of people. We have an incredible culture. And so I think we, we made a lot of decisions by gut feel um, tied to that action sports DNA. And you'll find a lot of outdoor brands behave that way. And it's, a, it's good. It's okay. But it's even better if you can tie that with data. And so I think um, where I'm really proud where we are today is you've got a team that has still retained that passion, culture, DNA, but now we've paired it with data and we've trained, you know, our entire group, our entire team, including the creative team who are the farthest uh, uh, right brains in the building to really look at and read the data and make decisions accordingly. So, I mean, even down to um, we do a monthly advertising review where we look at how did the creative perform? And we've got our creative director in there taking feedback and taking cues uh, back to the team to be able to refine what we're doing. So we're, we're a really nice balance, I think, of both passion, gut instinct, strong brand culture paired with good amount of data. We're probably not one of the most sophisticated brands out there, but I think it's the, the right balance that allows us to stay authentic with our consumer, but also stay smart and strategic with our spend. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, a lot of our listeners are customer-centric marketers. That's why they tune into this podcast because they're interested in not just like hardcore marketing, but let's say contact center, let's say customer experience and all, and all the aspects of that. I would like to know from your perspective, Jessica, what are some of the things that keep you up at night when you think mm -hmm. about the customer experience? Yeah, I mean, we're super omni-channel. Um, 
We sell to a really broad range of retailers across the world. I think we have 90,000 points of distribution, and that's everywhere from REI for our outdoor enthusiasts to Target to Best Buy, travel retail at an airport, um, to our own online presence, to Amazon. And so I think constantly trying to navigate and make sure that the customer experience is common across all these different touch points and maintaining that globally, um, physical retail displays to digital um, keeps me up at night that we're staying consistent um, across the globe and not consistent um, across the globe, online, offline. So wherever our consumer chooses to, to learn about us or shop, that they're having a good, positive, consistent experience with the brand. Something that you just said is omni-channel, and that reminds me of something called digital doorstep. When you hear digital doorstep, what does that mean to you? That I honestly have not heard that had not heard that phrase before. I'm guessing is that the kind of the fir- one of the first interactions um, into the brand? Is that how you define I, that? I think more people are getting uncomfortable with the word omni-channel, and I think yeah. that digital doorstep is just almost like every channel that is digital is like literally a porch or patio into the home of the company rather than when I think in the past about digital customer service or experience, it seems like maybe it's not in the house. It's like the guest house. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, wow. Yeah. That's, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go do my own research on that phrase. I mean, we're not of the, we're not afraid of the term omni-channel. I've been on businesses where that was a little bit of a dirty word. Um, and I'd say that that phrase doesn't make us nervous because we, we literally, as part of our brand DNA, have said we're a very democratic brand. We're broadly distributed. And we literally say that we want to be the, the, the top accessible tech brand for consumers. So wherever that is that they want to find us, and I think it's pretty typical in the consumer electronics space, Wherever it is that they might have that first interaction with us, whether it's walking into a, a Best Buy and they see this big, beautiful end cap display, or if it's hopping onto Amazon because they're a Prime member, or if they're coming in direct through our website, we just want to make sure they're having a great experience at any of the any of those doorsteps. We want it to be a great experience, and we're we're proud of that accessible distribution. Um, and, and have managed that quite well with our retail partners, we think. You are definitely paying attention to trends. You talked a lot about social, about listening to customers. If there's one trend that you're interested in looking forward to the future, what would one of those trends be? I mean, something that we've been working a lot on and have made incredible progress, but still there is so much runway is um, ESG and particularly around climate advocacy um, and sustainability, we, uh, we're a consumer electronics brand, right? So no easy task. And when I talk, going back to our consumer centricity a few years ago, we, as we were getting to know our real uh, current consumer targets, one of the things we identified was we weren't really doing anything to give back. We were doing some nice local things, but we weren't really doing anything to give back to the world. And so when we started to speak with our consumers and our employees, we identified sustainability as one of the top issues that our consumers care about. And as you know, and your audience knows, young consumers in particular care more and more and more about the values of a brand. And so it was a big, hairy topic because we are a consumer electronics brand. And so we, um, we actually partnered with Protector Winters, which was a climate advocacy organization from the action sports space. So that was our doorway in. And we started financially supporting them, but it cracked the door open for us to start to figure out how to address our own home, so to speak. And it prompted a bunch of really important activities that we've taken on in the space, which is um, one, we committed to helping eliminate e-waste. Um, we said we're going to eliminate a million pounds of e-waste by 2025, and we're halfway there. Shifted to 100% recyclable packaging. We added a carbon neutral checkout on our website. And now kind of the last bastion and the most important is really um, designing it into our products. But it is, um, I'd say I'm interested in it because 
it is a big, complicated topic. Um, it's something that is not just a marketing thing. And if people are looking at it as a marketing thing, that would be a mistake. But it is a pillar um, that consumers and our young consumers particularly care about. And I think often, um, you know, CMOs and mar the lead marketers in an organization are in a position to help champion those conversations. And so I'm, I'm very interested personally in seeing how different businesses navigate this. Um, I'm interested in seeing how my industry navigates this. We like to think we're taking the lead here. Um, and it's a very fine line between greenwashing um, and getting credit for the good work you've done. And we feel like we're, 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 you know, we're doing everything we can. We're continuing to move the needle. We're continuing to get smart, but then fully acknowledging we've got a lot of, a lot of work to do, but we do want consumers to know about the work that we're doing um, without presenting it in a, in a, in a greenwashing sort of way. So it's a, it's a big topic that I'm super fascinated by because it touches every part of an organization and then ultimately touches, you know, how you communicate that externally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of people are just like you, they're thinking, well, how do we create a product that, you know, it doesn't, it's they, the customer might not have it for their entire life. So what is the life life of time of the, of the product. Like what happens when the customer's done with the product? Where does it yeah. go? How can we elongate the life of the product? And this is something every consumer elect electronics company is grappling with. I want to close with a fun rapid fire round to get to know you yeah. better on a personal level. You ready to sure. do that? I think so. We'll see. All right, Jessica, <laughs> you are stuck on an Island. You have water, but you can bring one other food and one other drink. What are they? Oh, cheese and wine for sure. That was fast. <laughs> that was great. I lived in France for two years, so oh. it's a must have. Oh, yes. Yes. The, the I loved the camembert cheese and cheese is dessert. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. um, what is one resource or tool that you use to get through during COVID? Yoga. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Um, what is your most embarrassing work moment? Uh, yeah, this is easy because I'm looking at my glass door. My first week on the job, our whole building is this beautiful glass building with glass offices. And twice in my first week, I slammed headfirst into my glass door in front of uh, my CEO and the entire marketing department. So we now have a little sign on my door to stop me from doing that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, what is the best music or band of all time? Snoop Dogg. For sure. Yeah. For me. All right. Um, <laughs> if you had $1 billion, what would you do with it first? Oh, gosh. I mean, you can do a lot with a billion. Um, I mean, I'm probably supposed to say that I would give back to the world, but I also would love to have a vineyard. <laughs> oh, yes. And some cheese. <laughs> and I've, I've heard that the way to make a million dollars in the wine business is to start with two million. So a billion mm. could, could help with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And lastly, <laughs> if you could have if you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Okay, I. It's going to be Snoop Dogg. I got to stay consistent. I love him. Okay. <laughs> and I love how he has pivoted over so many years, kept yeah. his career relevant, um, and been such a part of popular culture. And I think his. His business, he is probably a very different um, person behind the scenes than he is on stage. And I, I, would, I would love a minute with Snoop Dogg. Amazing. Well, you could bring him into Skull Candy, I guess. That would be the way to I've do been it. working on it. I've been, I've been working on it for years. Mm -hmm. We actually sponsored Snoop Dogg before my time. I missed my window. Okay. Well, there's always next year. Um, <laughs> Jessica, it's been awesome having you on the show and hopefully you'll come back. Um, all of you have been tuning into The Modern Customer. If you have a moment, please leave a quick iTunes review so more people can find this growing customer experience podcast. Until next time, thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.